All right, well, today we're looking at a very controversial issue, and to be candid with you, I've never uh, taught on this in a single sermon. It's either been a multi-part series or in a conference, and so this morning we're really going to be zipping along, looking at a very controversial issue. So we begin today uh, with lie number four, and that is the idea that God predestined certain people to believe and others have no choice. Now, maybe you've heard this lie. It's certainly a very popular lie throughout the Christian world. And so we need to first define predestination, at least according to the popular view, the common view that's out there. And basically, what we see is that God predetermined certain people to have certain destinies. So that's where the word predestination comes from. For many people, they view it this way, that there's a predetermined destiny for each individual. And let me just say at the outset that that's going to be really uh, helpful to understand. The question is, does God predestine individuals or is there something else going on here? Because if God is predestining individuals, then we are essentially automatons. That means that we are controlled. We're going to automatically live out something that God has predetermined as if we're robots, as if we're puppets. And the grand uh, puppet master up in the sky is manipulating his hands and telling us, okay, preach the gospel here, and then this person I want you to believe. Okay, this person I'm going to have you reject. Okay, this person I'm going to have you believe. And so essentially, we're carrying out a charade where God is up in heaven controlling all of the actors, and we really have no choice. And so God would be going down the city street saying, heaven for you, and hell for you, and heaven for you, and hell for you. And then whatever he said in some sort of random act of kindness towards some, but not others, well, then that would be their fate. It would be sealed forever. And this is a very prevalent belief in the Christian world today. And let me just say that it's dangerous. I mean, you could almost, I'm not going to go that far this morning, but you could almost look at it as a different gospel. Now, why do I say that? Because it is no longer about looking to Jesus Christ and determining whether the cross means something to me, whether the resurrection means something to me, but instead it is about me being divinely picked according to some criteria that I'm not aware of that's not in the Bible, but God knows the secret criteria, and I was picked and you were not, and therefore the cross and the resurrection, I'm not sure what really, uh, and what active role they play in my salvation apart from God just sort of making it happen for me, but not making it happen for you. And so is this the true meaning of predestination? Well, this morning, I want us to begin with a few thought questions. First of all, for those who think they were pre-selected by God to be saved, here is a major problem. How could they ever really know if they were picked or not until it's too late? Do you see that? How could you know that you were picked? Oh, I, I believe that God pre-selected certain people. Well, are you one of them? Uh, I'd, I'd like to think so. And when are you going to know? Well, when I hit heaven, do, do you feel picked now? Well, I mean, I think so. And where is the security in that? Where is the rock-solid stability in Jesus Christ there? It is not there. It is based on the hope that I have been picked, but yet I come back to Jesus and Matthew saying, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, and then he will say, I never knew you. Could that be me? I feel picked, but maybe I'm not picked. Maybe I'll be the guy. Maybe I'll be the one that Jesus says that to in the end. Maybe I was under the delusion of being picked, but I never really was chosen. And so there is no security and no stability under this false belief system. 
Secondly, what is the motivation to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others? If a majority of them have no hope, not pre-selected, and then the ones who are picked will automatically believe anyway. What motivation is there for us to get excited and get motivated and go out and share the good news of Jesus Christ with other people if, well, it's all fate, so we might as well eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, and some will live, and some will die, and it's just fate, 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 so who really cares? And third, I just ask you this morning, do you see how the church, how the bride of Christ has adopted the Plato-Socrates debate over fate versus free will and divided over empty philosophy? Oh, well, I think they're both true. I think you walk through the door and it says whosoever calls, but then you get through the door and then it says, I already chose you. So it's a trick and we won't understand it until heaven, but it's a trick and we get philosophical and we debate and, you know, if I lift this up and then drop it, was that fate or free will? Was that pre Do you realize that for thousands of years, Greek philosophers have been debating this very same thing? And all we did was come along and put a little Jesus stamp on it and call it theology? We've called it theological debate and we've divided it into two camps, essentially. Calvinists and Arminians. And we have reenacted the Plato-Socrates debate over fate and free will and called it Jesus theology. And so this morning, we're asking the question, what's really going on with predestination in Ephesians and Romans? Because isn't that what matters? It's not what's going on with predestination in my head or your head or in my theology book of an ism, it's more about what is going on concerning predestination in the Bible. Now that's a crazy idea, right? In the Bible. So this morning, we're going to begin by looking at Ephesians. And I just want to say at the outset, there is an incredible revelation here for you this morning in God's Word. There is an incredible revelation where your whole concept of predestination can just go, whoa. It can just go, boom, as you see for the first time that it is not about individual selection. And so we first take a look at, at the book of Ephesians. And what I've done here is I've pulled out certain pronouns. Now, you remember what a pronoun is, right? From fourth or fifth grade, they taught you what a pronoun is. A pronoun is he or she or it or we or you or they. And there's so many different pronouns in the English language. And here, I've highlighted these pronouns because I want us to see this morning that predestination is not about me and you individually. Instead, it's about two people groups. And so first, we see in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul. Now, what nationality is Paul? Do you remember that Paul, of course, is a Jewish person? He's a Jewish apostle. And remember who his ministry is to. Who is Paul ministering to? Well, he's ministering to Gentiles as a Jewish person. Now, that's going to really matter as we look at this. Here's Paul, and he says, God chose us. Now, who is the us? Well, that refers to Paul and his fellow Jews. God chose us. And isn't that true? I mean, the entire Old Testament story is that God chose the Jews. The Jews are God's chosen people. And the Gentiles, well, uh, good luck. Ephesians says they were excluded. They were outside the commonwealth of Israel. Gentiles, non-Jews, had no hope and no covenant and no God. Ouch! They needed hope. 
And that hope would come, but for thousands of years, it was primarily the, the Jewish people that God worked with. And there were exceptions. People like Rahab came to faith. Rahab the harlot, the prostitute, she was a Gentile. There were other Gentiles who came to be right before God through faith. But Israel was God's chosen people. And so God chose us, Paul would say, us Jews. And then in verse 5, he predestined us. And then he defines this we us meaning. What does we mean? What does us mean? Well, in the same chapter, he says, we who were the first to hope in Christ. Now think about which group heard the gospel first. The Jews, right? It was Peter, James, and John in the city of Jerusalem. And from there, the gospel exploded out to every nation. And so Paul was sent later to the Gentiles, but it was Peter, James, and John and the other teachers of the gospel that brought this message to the Jews first in the city of Jerusalem. And so he says, we who were the first to put our hope in Christ, and then he goes on in chapter 2 and he says, like the rest, and that's the nice way of putting it uh, concerning Gentile. Yeah, like the rest of those people, we Jews also have believed and been saved by grace through faith. That's what he's saying. Like the rest, we also had to come to salvation by faith. It wasn't our law keeping. We had to get saved just like the rest of the world by faith in Jesus, not by works of the Jewish law. And so he says in verse 3 also, all of us also. So do you see where we're going with this? What if, I ask you this morning, what if we have gotten this thing wrong about predestination? We Globally, the church, we have made it about individual selection. You, but not you, and you, but not you, and you, but not you. But what if it's about people groups? What if it's about Israel being chosen first to get the gospel first, and then somebody else was chosen second to get the gospel second? And so we see exactly this as we continue to look at Ephesians and discover the true meaning of predestination. Look at this, chapter 1. You also were included. So let me get this straight. Paul has said, we were predestined, we were chosen, and then he says, you also were included. Now, who would the you also be? If you're writing a letter to somebody and you say, you also, who are you talking about? The recipients of the letter. Are you talking about eight of them? Or 12 of them? No, in this case, thousands and thousands of them. Whoever will read this letter, you also were included. Chapter 2, as for you, you were dead. You who are Gentiles. I love it when Paul is just plain and clear and explicit. He has already said, we are Jews and you are Gentiles. You were separate. You Gentiles were separate. You Gentiles were far away. And what is he writing this for? I'm writing this for the sake of you Gentiles. God did this for the sake of you Gentiles. And so we see that clearly in the first three chapters, Paul is using pronouns in a major way. And this is not a grammar lesson this morning. What's the takeaway? The takeaway is it's not you singular, it's you plural. The takeaway is that the gospel is for all of us. Do you hear that? The gospel message is for all of us. The way God puts it is whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. This is a big deal because when the message gets out, anybody can take hold of it. Where is it? Well, don't make predictions about it. Don't say somebody's going to descend and don't say somebody's going to ascend, but instead say about everybody that the word is right here up in their ear, inches away, that all they have to do is hear and believe. And the moment that they call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, boom. Is it for them? Yeah, it's for anybody and everybody. And that is awesome. Ephesians 
goes on to tie a bow up and, and present this package to us by bringing Jews and Gentiles together. Look at chapter 2. God made the two groups one. Who are the two groups? Jews and Gentiles. To reconcile both of them. Who are the both? Again, Jews and Gentiles. Peace to you who were far away. Who was far away from the gospel? Which group was far away? We've got multiple choice, right? Jews or Gentiles. Which group was far away? The Gentiles were far away. So... Peace has been preached to those who were far away, and then peace has been preached to those who are near, right there in Jerusalem. They got the message first. And through Jesus, we both have access. So, isn't it ironic? I mean, just think about this. Isn't it ironic that one of the most divisive doctrines in Christianity today is actually supposed to bring people together. I mean, people are fighting over fate and free will, and do we have a choice, or are we pre-selected? And we get divided down the middle over this, and God's whole intention was to take two groups and bring them together. And then we take that idea and smash it apart. Imagine this morning if I had a $10,000 bill in my pocket. Now it's a $5 bill. I'm going to admit I didn't have a $10,000 bill laying around. But if I had a $10,000 bill in my hand this morning, and I told you the buying power of this $10,000 bill, I bragged on what this $10,000 bill could get you, and then, and then I offered it. I offered it to everyone in this room and everyone out there listening online, imagine if I offered it to every single person out there, who would want it? Just hypothetically, raise your hand if you'd be interested. Okay. Well, I'm sorry, I already pre-selected Rex. <laughs> so my offer was fake. Do you see that? My offer was fake. God's offer is not fake. God's offer is real. Whosoever actually calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So we see the result then in Ephesians chapter 2. The result is, verse 14, you are no longer foreigners, you Gentiles. You're no longer excluded. You're no longer out. Now you can be in you too are being built together along with the Jews. Gentiles are heirs with Israel. Amen? Amen? By the way, that's probably you, just saying. Unless you're Jewish, that's probably you. So this is kind of a big deal that we got included. It's kind of a big deal that we get invited to the table. It's kind of a big deal that we can take hold of this not being of the nation of Israel. So what do we see in the book of Romans? Is the book of Romans different? Well, no. Strangely, ironically, the book of Romans has the very same thing, thing to say. Remember, predestination is taught where? The true concept of predestination is taught in Ephesians and Romans. Now, what do they have in common? The Ephesians happen to be Gentiles. The Romans happen to be Gentiles. Why don't Peter and James and John go on and on about predestination? Why can't you find Peter and James and John talking all about who was selected? Because they are writing Jewish people, and Jewish people already know that they're God's chosen people. The newsflash, the big deal... The controversy is not over Israel being chosen. The controversy is over these dirty, rotten Gentiles. No offense, but these dirty, rotten Gentiles being chosen by God. Are you kidding me? God, you, you, you brought Messiah, and now you're going to offer the same message and the same hope and the same forgiveness and the same new life to those people? I mean, they didn't even like you. 
They didn't chase after you. They didn't pursue you. They weren't running on the treadmill of law. You should have seen them, God, for thousands of years. What, are you blind? I mean, they rejected you and they went to war with us and they tried to kill us. They wanted to destroy us. They weren't law abiders. They were law breakers in every way, and you're going to come to them and offer them the same salvation that you offer us? God, that is downright offensive. What are you thinking? And so that was the controversy. That was what the Apostle Paul was wrestling with. Remember his job description? What is Paul's job description? To bring the gospel to those people. And guess what Paul's best friends growing up thought of that? Ooh, gross. That stinks. Who would want that job? That can't be right. And so Paul is defending his job. And he says here in Romans, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles, 924, I will call them my people who are not my people, Romans 925, And then the clincher, you know, you know as well as I do, that when the Apostle Paul says, what shall we say then? Right? He says this in in Romans a few times. And when he says, what shall we say then? It's time for you to listen. I mean, this is the Cliff's Notes, okay? Because if you haven't been paying attention, if you got exhausted by Romans 8... Well, he's going to sum it up for you. What shall we say then? At least, at least take in this sentence, right? If you have a problem with paying attention to what Romans 1 to 9 is about, verse 30, well, it tells you the summation concerning Jews and Gentiles. It says this, What shall we say then that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness? Whoa. They weren't looking for it. They didn't chase after it. They didn't try to earn it. They didn't care about Moses. They would have said, Moses who? A lot of them would have said, Moses, never heard of him. And so we see that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness. And that is the white flag waving in the air going, Paul's going, Yoo-hoo, hello, predestination. Uh, this is what it's about. What shall we say then? Uh, that the Gentiles were predestined to get this too, even though they didn't deserve it, even though they weren't looking for it, even though they weren't chasing after it, they got it too. And uh, that's why I'm out on the road sharing this with everybody imaginable. How about some support, people? (laughs) All right, well, we've seen a lot of Ephesians and Romans concerning this Jew-Gentile issue. And hopefully for you, the The idea of predestination is coming alive, that God is not exclusive here. He has said it's for anybody and everybody. But you know what? There are some questions that we need to talk through, I think, some very common questions. First, we'll start with what I think is an easy one. We've already sort of alluded to it. Why does Paul write about predestination for several chapters in Ephesians and Romans? Well, You know, we've already said Ephesians are Gentiles, so they need this message. Otherwise, they're going to think, well, it's great that the Apostle Paul is being nice, but I'm not not an Israelite. It's great that he's sharing with us this gospel message, but, you know, I don't have a history with Yahweh, so what hope is there for me? So first, we see that Paul is writing the right audience for this. He's saying, you're included, you're invited, you get to be a part of this. And secondly, Paul is defending his job. And quite honestly, he's been attacked over this issue. It's not easy. You know, Paul has hurt feelings. You can see it in his letters. I know we're supposed to say that all Scripture is is inspired by God, and it is. But God let Paul's feelings show many times. You foolish Galatians. What do you think he's feeling? Is he just happy? (laughs) Passive aggressive, oh, you, you golly shucks, you foolish Galatians. No, he's ticked off. He's frustrated. All right? What about when he talks about other uh, people that are bringing in another message, the so-called super apostle type guys, and didn't we preach, and didn't I, wasn't I with you, and 
Didn't I, wouldn't I have you know, done anything for you? And didn't I? I mean, he's telling these Corinthians and other churches, look, we served you and we preached Jesus Christ crucified. And, and, and we came in and you're dissing us now for some other message. So Paul writes in Ephesians and Romans so many words about this because he wants people to know I'm doing the right thing. I have a calling to this. God sent me out to preach this and you are the right audience for this. All right, well, someone who believes in God's individual selection of other people might say, well, what about sovereignty? I mean, is this somehow disrespecting God's sovereignty? Now, if you know what sovereignty means, it basically means uh, God's authority or rule over. Now, what I love about the biblical view of predestination is it esteems God's sovereignty. He is going against the grain here. He did not have to save Gentiles. He did not have to do this. It was unpopular with his own people. It was unpopular, and he chose to do it. And so God has a right. God has a right to choose God has a right to choose the Gentile peoples of the world. And Paul is defending God's sovereignty, God's sovereign choice to choose Gentiles. And so somebody says, well, what about Acts 13? This is sort of that stray, random verse. You know how there's always a verse in the book of Acts. But what about that verse in Acts where it says, well, this is a classic case of this. Look at this. Acts 13, 48, it says certain people, it seems like certain people were appointed for eternal life. But I want you to notice again, again, curiously, coincidentally, Gentiles are mentioned in the same verse. And so what's the news flash here? Can you guys believe it? Gentiles have been appointed for eternal life. Whoa not just Jews. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord. And all, who would that be? The Gentiles present. All who were appointed for eternal life believed. That's awesome. There wasn't a straggler. There wasn't somebody there who was saying, eh, 99 of y'all, I see what you said, but I'm... They all believed. And that's amazing news. All right, well, what about Jacob I loved... And Esau, I hated. Well, curiously, uh, Jacob had 12 sons, didn't he? And those 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. And so Jacob represents Israel, and Esau represents the Gentiles. So when Paul brings this up, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated, do you see what he's saying? Israel I loved, historically, The Gentiles I hated historically, and I can do whatever I want. I could continue hating Esau. I could continue hating the Gentiles. I could turn around and hate Israel if I wanted. I am God, and you are not. You don't tell me what to do, he would say. And so the point of Paul bringing this up is... God calls the shots. In the past, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated, but guess what? Today, I'm going to love those Gentiles. I'm going to extend my heart to those Gentile people. I'm going to do the unthinkable. I've always done whatever I wanted. I'm going to continue doing what I want because I am the Lord God, sovereign over all. What about Pharaoh's heart being hardened? Some people take this idea and they say, well, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Therefore, God is going down the city street and saying, well, I'm going to harden your heart and I'm going to harden your heart. I'm going to leave your heart soft. Uh, I'm going to harden your heart and yours, but I'm going to leave yours soft. And so, again, we're back to an individual hardening or softening of hearts. And that is not where Paul takes it. Do you know where Paul goes in the book of Romans with this? He says... After giving this illustration, he says that there was a partial hardening of Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles came in. So it's not about an individual hardening. It's about Israel saying, Messiah, what Messiah? We're looking for a military leader. What Messiah? Oh, Jesus? Are you kidding? Jesus died. I mean, Jesus ended in... Messiah, he hasn't come yet. We're waiting. So they rejected Israel. And God gave them over and said, okay, if you're going to reject Jesus, there's no hope outside of Jesus. 
And so there was a partial hardening of Israel, not of individuals on your city street, a partial hardening of Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles came in. Do you know who is hardening hearts today? Do you know who is blinding people to the gospel today? The Apostle Paul writes that it is Satan. Satan is hardening hearts and blinding people to the gospel, not God. And so what are we thinking when we take the work of Satan today and then propose that that's what God is doing? Not the truth. Not the truth that set us, sets us free. All right, well, what about the potter and the clay? Because you remember Paul says in Romans, God is the potter, we are the clay. And therefore, uh, you know, he can make one for honorable use, maybe, you know, and then another for common use. So then many people, you know, they take common use and they turn that into hell. And then honorable use is heaven. So we've got our heaven-hell theology going with common use and honorable use. But that's not what Paul means. First of all, he talks about two kinds of vessels. Who are the vessels of wrath that were prepared for destruction? Gentiles. Who are the vessels of mercy who historically have gotten nothing but mercy from God? The Jews. So if God wants to take a piece of clay and do whatever he wants, honorable use, common use, this spiritual gift, that spiritual, he can do whatever he wants. He's God. He's the potter. We're just the clay. So if he wants to take a vessel of wrath, prepared for destruction, a Gentile, and say, whoa, even you have called upon the name of the Lord to be saved? Okay. He's the potter. We're just the clay. We don't get to say, oh, no, Lord, not that clay. And so that is what Paul is saying here. All right, conclusions. What did we see today? I don't want to say a lot. I'd rather let the Word of God Speak for itself. For God so loved whom? The world. Not a few people. The world. That He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Is God faking that? Is it the, the $10,000 bill? Is it a fake offer? No. Whoever actually decides to believe in Him will not perish but have eternal life. 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. Check this out. Read it slowly. It is so awesome. The heart of God exposed, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Is that not amazing? That means your next door neighbor. That means the guy across the street. That means the example that we come up with to trick people. But what if a person lived like this their whole life? God wants all to come to repentance. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2. And if I am lifted up, Jesus said, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. Am I going to pick some? I'm going to draw all. Can they reject me? Yes. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. There's a response there. We beg you, we implore you, be reconciled. You can choose to not be reconciled. You could harden your heart, but we beg you, be reconciled. Don't harden your heart. Romans 10, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So can you know? Can you know that you're in? Yes, you can know. It's not about a random choosing, an arbitrary picking. It is about the day that you said yes. And because you belong to the category called everyone, because you belong to the category called anyone, you can call upon the name of the Lord, be saved, and know that God is a promise keeper and God is a truth teller. And the moment you open the door, he said, I will come in and live with you forever. That, my friend, is our assurance. Not a random choosing, but an opening of the door and knowing 
that God responded. So what did we see today? The lie that God predestined certain people to believe and others have no choice. What is the truth? God wants everyone to come to repentance and be saved. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the truth of the gospel. When we hear this, we get excited about sharing. We don't know who's going to respond. We don't know who's going to react. We don't know what others are going to think. But we thank you, Father, that we don't have to fall prey to philosophy. A dead man can never choose, they say. And yet you say, do not harden your heart. It's a choice. A dead man cannot call. And you say, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Father, we thank you that we were dead in our sins, but we have been made alive. We thank you that you've made a promise to us that you are a truth teller and a life giver. We celebrate the offer extended to the whole Gentile world and the Jewish people today. We thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.